Yeah. Well, has anyone ever been to a talk that you haven't actually seen? So, yeah, like she said, um, we are basically amateur colleges, and um, we used to go down to Chatfield State Park quite a bit um, back in like, 2006, 2007, and I just, um, one of my hobbies is looking for reptiles and amphibians in the wild and trying to photograph them, and you know, that's just a personal passion of ours, so we would spend a lot of time down here at Chatfield, and um, you know, I started going online looking to see if I could get a list of what the reptiles and amphibians in the park did. We're saying information at all about the reptiles and amphibians that live in Chapter, and there's nothing there. So uh, Dan and I approached then senior ranger Chris Bradshaw, who's an awesome game that she was still around. And she was very enthusiastic about um, setting up a study with us where we just you know basically went around in the field and recorded all the data that we could on the reptiles and amphibians that we saw there. And so we just put together a study, it's actually published online, we did maps and you know it was Record everything and really put together uh, what I think is a very complete picture of all the reptiles and activities that live in the park. So, Dan and I are actually very qualified to uh, talk about the herbs, as we call it, of Chatfield State Park. And basically, what we're going to do is just give you guys a species by species breakdown. We're just going to run through every critter that lives in there and just teach you about its natural history, and, you know, diet, and all of that kind of thing. And then um, at the end, we have a little bit of a quiz for you. That Emily insisted we do. <laughs> That's not true. To uh, <laughs> see how much you retained. And I believe that all of the answers to the quiz are somewhere in our uh, presentations and talks and things like that. So, Dan and I each put together a PowerPoint, and uh, he's mostly personally interested in the amphibians. And so, um, we had him do the amphibians, the turtles, the aquatic stuff, and I'm going to uh, afterwards talk to you about the snakes and the lizards that are there. So, Dan is going to. Teach about the amphibians and turtles. And so, as you said, amphibians and turtles in Chatfield State Park. We'll go ahead and get started relatively quickly because there are a lot of facts and different information to. Uh, oh get wait! Before you start, can you sure. tell us how you got interested? In why is herpetology cool? Uh, actually, Joe got me interested into <laughs> herpetology. I mean, I've, I've kept reptiles when I was a, a kid, and always had a passion for fishing and getting outdoors and doing a lot of different things like that, but. Uh, when I met Joe, he said, let's go out and let's go herping, and this is pretty much where I got started. So about 2006, I believe, like I said, uh, we got started and started walking around. And, I mean, the first time you flip over a board or a rock or something to that effect, and you see a snake under, and you have no idea what it is. It's just, it's something you'll never forget. And from that point on, I've just been absolutely hooked. So we go all over the state and do different surveys and work with different groups and look with different people and just do it for fun. And it's just something that's really exciting to me. And um, I have a five-year-old daughter and I love getting her involved and getting outside and just walking around in nature and kind of exploring. So it's something that we can do and, and feel comfortable knowing somewhat where dangerous things are and where safe habitat tends to be so um, it's it's just something that uh, I think is nice to pass on to children uh, in general it's something that I don't think I'll ever get sick of doing so as long as I can uh, get out and feel it's just a lot of fun personal opinion mostly some people don't necessarily have the passion but it is it is neat to see wildlife in any aspect in my opinion so, uh, first we're going to go through what we have here. One salamander, two turtles, one toad, and three frogs. Um, one salamander is pretty much statewide, and it is the tiger salamander. It's the only salamander that lives here in Colorado. Um, primarily active, tend to be in spring when they're moving from their dens, or where they uh, hibernate in mostly prairie dog holes, things like that and they move to their breeding pools. Um, so you might see them during a spring storm, some rain, uh, moving towards the ponds, crossing roads, things like that. Uh, but the rest of the year, they tend to be kind of out of sight, out of mind. They are very private. Um, the land dwelling adults are uh, active March through November primarily, uh, but you tend to not see them through that whole range, even though they are around. Um, they are opportunistic feeders. They will eat uh, just about anything they can feed in their, their fit in their mouths as adults. Um, so as they develop, they are born into the water 
and they are in a water dog stage where they have uh, gills that come out of their head and as they mature some of them go to what they call terrestrial adults where they'll walk. Some of them will continue to stay in their larval form and turn cannibalistic and eat actually other tiger salamanders. So they tend to get very large and they can stay in the water indefinitely or they can mature later on in life and actually become terrestrial. But uh, we do have large females that can produce up to a thousand eggs um, in one season. <coughs> they are eaten by raccoons, coyotes, um, aquatic turtles, garter snakes, a lot of different birds and fish. And um, they don't really, they're not poisonous or anything to that effect. They're, they're pretty docile. And as you can see, we have one on the table there. Um, this is one that was brought to me uh, many, many years ago. Yeah. Um, as a little guy that was actually crawling across the snow. So they're really tough, hardy animals. Um, he was found in October. Uh, you said it was 25 degrees. Yes, yeah, it, was, it was 25 degrees outside when he was found. So if that gives you uh, any idea how tough these guys are. How big do they get? Um, they'll get a good size bigger than that. Um, they'll get about I'd say eight to ten inches generally. From head to tail. To uh, from head to tail, yes. Snout to snout to the end of tail. So you know, those cannibalistic ones that stay in the water that you were saying have the record for the largest. They get really good. What determines? No, no, no. What determines if they become cannibalistic or terrestrial? I don't really know. I mean, I would I would imagine it would be probably something to do with the amount of food that's provided and, and if they're thriving at that at that. They say that there's some things that happen in the body, hormones and such, that would make it mature. Um, there have been studies on things like axolotls, which is a, uh, a water dog in Mexico that lives its whole life as a larval form. But they can introduce particular hormones, I believe, that make it mature into a land-dwelling adult. So it's not necessarily a unknown science, but I couldn't tell you directly what it is that makes them nice. They thrive. <laughs> but they can stay like that their entire life cycle? Yeah, they can. And they specialize wow. in feeding on a uh, larval stage. Salamanders. Salamanders. It's really an unusual phenomenon. And they are also used by fishermen as bait. Um, so different things can be introduced, different groups can be introduced, and they are in the reservoir, things that get off the hook in situations like that, but they also live here naturally. Okay. Excuse me. Are they the ones that, I've seen big ones floating like in Rocky Mountain National Park on the surface of the Absolutely, yeah. This is in Colorado, this is a salamander, this is that. Here's a picture of a tiger salamander. Um, they're beautiful. Their colors and pattern varies from uh, it could be dark brown to an olive green to a bright lemon yellow. Um, so they're really variable. They can have a lot of yellow or a lot of brown. Some of them we've seen just look like the color of mud. Um, so they're, they're highly variable. But if you see a salamander and it looks like it's smiling at you, it's probably a salamander. Um, it's going to be a tiger salamander in Colorado, as far as we know. Less than least pet or something crazy like that. If we wanted to find one, where, where should we go look? <laughs> I would say, I mean, we've found maybe three in the park since we've done this, and it tends to be rainy nights. You might see them crossing the road. Um, to find one of these sitting in the grass, I mean, if you live in this area, look in your window wells. Um, they tend to be on the move and they end up in people's window wells more than anything else that you hear. Toads, things like that, on the move in the window wells. Um, but as far as going out to search for one, it's a, it's, it's a tough thing well, to do. Uh, their preferred habitat is really a small, shallow body of water without big game fish in So like, you would never want to go look at you know, the main reservoir or some of the vast ponds around here in Chatfield. 
But if we were to drive around and uh, find some little shallow uh, cattle ponds out in the prairie around here that just mostly fill up after rains and stuff like that, if you go in March and April, um, you can walk around the edge and look. And you'll, you'll see them this time of year only, um, just kind of hanging out there because they congregate in those ponds to breed. And then in one month, they disperse. You could conceive but we don't find them right now. Do they tend to like sun themselves on the turtles or they don't? Uh, they're, they're just in the shallows. Um, they have to stay wet. Is that good? They like some vegetation, but I mean, we find them just nothing but you know, mud bowls, a little water. In the park, tough to find. They're Outside of the park, a little bit easier. But a lot of traffic through here, a lot of people. So um, a lot of the water, it's just not a lot of suitable habitat. Uh, bullfrog. Yeah, bullfrogs, things like that. So, Is there a time of day for that? Did you, sorry, did you say that they, uh, not in the, the adults, when they're in the terrestrial form, do tend to go down into burrows and places like that, and that's where they find a nice, moist place to live, and they don't necessarily go to water all year long. They'll be found in burrows primarily throughout the year, and only move to water to actually breed as terrestrial adults. There's a lot of, they're considered a case species. There have been a lot of observations of them interacting with prairie dogs a lot. So here's a big larval tiger salamander. And um, was this a, is this one you thought was a, um, this, this is just a, one of the pretty, first ones I ever found. So it's a big larval tiger salamander, and you can see the gills come off. And what happens when they start to mature is these actually draw up into the body and they turn into these little nubs and they just kind of disappear into the head. And you'll start to see the pattern come out a little bit more as they as they come out um, and they mature. So you know, it's actually really cool. And sorry to interrupt, Dan, but uh, this is a species that you're actually allowed to take a certain amount for a while. So uh, you know, if you have kids or grandkids, like you do with a tadpole, bring a tadpole and you know watch it mature into a frog with a kid. This is actually a really neat thing to do that with. If you have just a little tiny glass aquarium or fish bowl or something, you can put a larval one in there and watch it, you know, turn it into an adult. It's pretty cool. Okay, speaking of tadpoles, <laughs> we went to, or I worked for uh, Primrose, and uh, this was 10 years ago, and we had, or they let us have a bull, or two bullfrog tadpoles. Okay, so we brought them back to the tank one of them had passed away, but the other one never changed into a bullfrog. He was a tadpole for almost nine years. Nine years? Yes. So, it was the most amazing we'll thing. go into a little bit of that during bullfrogs, but basically bullfrogs have developed something, and I don't know about nine years, I believe you wholeheartedly, but I, I, that's I, I, I had the form for Guinness Book of World Records, <laughs> 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 and I was waiting yep. for the yeah. home. We will definitely touch upon that and, uh, and kind of the life cycle of the bullfrog and how it works and, and how it, it does survives <laughs> and how it does some of these things. So uh, next we're going to move on to the turtles. Uh, snapping turtle is typically found in permanent bodies of water around here. Um, average adult size approximately 35 pounds. Um, they, get, they get very big. Um, and they can be dangerous, so this is not something that you tend to want to be anywhere near the mouth. But they are also very um, reclusive. They don't tend to want to be around you any more than you know any other reptile or amphibian out there for the most part. So uh, they're pretty easy to avoid. Um, eggs are generally buried in a uh, in a burrow dug by the female. And what she'll do is she'll kind of prop herself up on a nice sandy shore during a uh, particular time of year and pull the sand back and dig a nice deep hole, deposit her eggs, cover it up, and go back into the water. And they will uh, develop and move into the water on their own. Um, so there have been 
nests documented with over 100 eggs in them. So they do, we do have a lot of them in the park, and they are pretty prolific, but they do have a lot of predators when they're small and in the egg stage. Um, raccoons, skunks, uh, mammals of uh, different foxes can get into their nests and they do different things so sometimes you can go out and see a nest that's been raided and you can kind of understand what it might have been um, after the fact i believe raccoons tend to do they eat the shells or do they leave the shells or the skunks that leave the shells one of them leaves the shells and one doesn't so skunks and raccoons do kind of different things but those are the two most known culprits around here um, uh, as adults, they're pretty tough. Um, predation tends to happen by humans. There have been some documented cases of coyotes eating, snapping turtles, and things like that. Um, for the most part, they're in the water, so there's not a lot of things that can get to them. Uh, hibernation usually occurs in debris and shallow water, uh, so they can kind of bury themselves in the mud and uh, just slow everything down and reduce the amount of oxygen that they need. But they are also opportunists where they'll come out on sunny days and kind of you know, move around a little bit, things like that. So, big snapping turtle. And they are beautiful. Um, they have glands towards the rear of their legs um, to kind of ward off any predator that would mess with them, and it's kind of a musk. Um, so if you grab them or something to that effect, they can lay out pretty good smell uh, that's not necessarily a, make you want to eat them. Okay. So. How long does it take for a skin to get to 35 pounds? Uh, I believe they can live 30, 40 years. Um, at adult size, I believe it would probably be 10 years, something like that. It takes a while for them to get to be adults. When they come out, they're about yay big, and um, they kind of have a real bumpy, kind of spiky shell, and as they get older, it just kind of smooths out a little bit, they have these little spikes on there, they just really look prehistoric, and they have a, a heck of a reach with that neck, so I wouldn't ever recommend grabbing one of these things unless you, uh, they, they definitely have some good reach, um, <laughs> and, and, and really big claws also, so I mean, they can, they can probably scratch the heck out of you. <laughs> Western Painted Turtle. Uh, this is the official reptile of Colorado. This happened a couple years ago. I believe it was like a sixth grade class that decided that Colorado should have a state reptile. And they took it and it was successful. They, they took it down to the, uh, the government and, and let them know that it was a great idea. And it passed. So this is our state reptile. Um, they can be found in permanent or seasonal waters, and they prefer heavy vegetation. Um, Basking <coughs> spots is where you'll tend to see these guys, a, a log, something half submerged in water, and they are known to kind of share with each other, and six or seven can be stacked up on one particular log, and you walk up and you see six or seven hawks in the water, and that might be all you see, but if you kind of creep up, they'll stand there for a little while and kind of let you observe them. So these also uh, bury themselves in the mud, uh, in shallow water. Um, it has been noted that if the water isn't deep enough, that the water completely freezes down to the bottom. Uh, they can freeze during winter, so uh, it depends. About three feet of water tends to be what they say is where they hibernate generally. Will they actually bask with the snapping turtles, or do they only bask with their own I've never seen them on the same log. I've seen them on the same basket. So. I've never seen them with their ponds like that, but there are those. So I'm those, sure if the log is correct. Right. But really, the snapping turtles, I've never seen them on the snapping turtles. Christine found them last year, being something they became a turtle. Christine found them last year, being something they became a turtle. This is so cute. <laughs> so they kept getting caught every time we went down there. <laughs> The Woodhouse Toad. Um, this is a 
really tough species that can be found throughout Czech. Uh, they live in meadows, riparian zones. Um, we've seen them swimming by uh, down Plum Creek. Uh, they, they, are, they are very tough and they get pretty big. Um, they can be about softball size, we've seen them in here. So they are they're pretty big and tough. Um, Toad's defense, they have a little uh, gland on the side of their head that can kind of ooze out a little bit of a, a noxious paste that if a dog gets them in their mouth or something to that effect, it can make them foam quite a bit and it can be pretty toxic. So uh, try to keep dogs from eating toads and things like that. They got a pretty good little defense. But other than that, they're real docile. Like usually, if you see one and pick it up, most they'll do is pee on you. Almost every time. Almost every time. That's right. absolutely right. They have a lot of water in their bodies and they're not afraid to use it. So, um, they breed primarily from April through June, uh, shallow waters. Uh, so you might see them driving down the road in a, in a small, uh, just puddle on the side of the road. And they tend to be a very dark black um, tadpole and pretty good groups of them. So. 10,000 games uh, they can average. So uh, they're playing the numbers game, really. Um, not all of those are going to make it to adulthood, and there's a lot of things that eat them. So they eat uh, a lot of caterpillars, invertebrates, uh, things around here, beetles, ants, just about any kind of invertebrate and things that they can get in their mouth. I'm sure that they would eat a small mammal if they could get a small mammal in their mouth. Um, a lot of these things are just opportunists. They are going to eat what is available to them. So just because it's not necessarily documented doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, it happens in a lot of cases where you see odd stuff and you're like, wow, that has never been something that I thought would happen. So, uh, predators, garter snakes, bull snakes, along with several birds and mammals, um, they are a lot more susceptible to getting eaten when they're small. These things, when they uh, change, they are about two tic tacs, uh, little guys. So a lot of birds would just swoop down, have a little lunch, eat ten of them at a time, fly off, move on to something else. Um, last summer we were fishing over at Chatfield, and there were little toads, but not so big. Is that what these were? That's what these are. Okay, um, on the edge of the lake. Yep. When they're smaller, they tend to have little red spots on them. Um, they get confused with the different species we have in Colorado called the red species or red spotted toad quite a bit. Uh, but here in Chatfield, this is the only toad that we've observed. And as they get older, those red dots tend to kind of blur into the skin and it's more, uh, we'll show a picture here shortly of an adult. Hibernate, hibernation tends to happen in, uh, they just burrow into the soil, kind of below the frost and uh, where it'll freeze and just wait. We have these all over, so I've seen these all over here by the building, but I've also, when we did the herpetology um, class in June, um, they were right by the pond and had gone down this hole by one of the signposts and then posted it in the ground. <laughs> and it, there somehow somebody already burrowed in there once they, or maybe there was already a burrow there when they did the post, I'm not sure, but um, they're all over the place that there. I can't take credit for this beautiful photography. This is this is Joe, big passion of his, so I'm using his pictures in my PowerPoint. <laughs> He's got to give all the credit to him on these things. Do you have plates? Do sound? Oh, I do. Absolutely. All of our uh, toads and frogs do have a call, so I'll go ahead and make sure the volume's turned up here. Interesting call. Here in Colorado. 
uh, dwindling numbers, uh, populations used to be pretty prevalent through this area, and they are just less and less, it tends to be every year, I think you see less of them for the most part, but they are in check field um, and can be spotted uh, generally in riparian areas um, along the South Platte and the uh, Plum Creek drainage there, um, mostly prior to the main reservoir. Um, egg masses tend to be about 3,000 eggs, uh, so not as prolific as the toads, but they are definitely uh, putting a lot of numbers out there. Uh, primary food tends to be invertebrates also, but as most things out here, they are opportunists. Um, as they're younger, a lot of water bugs, uh, invertebrates, things of that sort, uh, as they're moving around, and I believe uh, leaves and things like that also, uh, they eat different kinds of plant matter uh, when they're younger. So, uh, predators, the main one would be the adult bullfrogs. Uh, they just love to snack on these things. Uh, snapping turtles, garter snakes, raccoons, fish, um, birds of prey, lots of things eat these guys. So that's one reason why they're on uh, everybody's list for food, so probably why they're being wiped out. Also disease and different things that are kind of being introduced to different environments and also being just habitat being encroached on for, they're pretty susceptible. Are they pretty susceptible to pollution or crazy water? I don't know about the water temperature necessarily, but I know that the amount of ponds that they breed in here at Chatfield are very few. Um, the bullfrogs tend to like that kind of deep edge, so they'll kind of sit on the side and, and dive down deep. And the northern leopard frogs tend to like a little bit more shallow, uh, grassy areas, maybe with some reeds in there and some leaf litter and some things to hide around. Um, so. A lot of these ponds are seasonal, and depending on what kind of rainwater we get and snow runoff, um, sometimes the ponds that we've seen them breed in in the last couple of years don't even get an inch of water in them, and we don't see them breeding in there. So we're not necessarily sure where they're going to replace that breeding habitat. It just doesn't happen. So um, depending on the season and, and the ponds that they choose, uh, they could have, I mean, we've seen them have booming years where you take a step and they're just everywhere. They just scatter. Um, but it hasn't happened for a bit. And that's just a lot of weather, I think. We did, yeah, we did see one when we went out for the weekend last year, um, where the beaver dam is the very first one, where that water is all well. They knew that um, catching one there, which was cool. But I never seen one the only one I've ever seen. I did have another question about this. The herons eat these guys. Will herons also <laughs> eat the toad or just the frogs? Do you know about that? I couldn't tell you particularly on the heron and what the diet of the heron is, but I would probably think that as babies, those herons probably. Yeah, I mean, as they get older, that would be a tougher meal. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, I was wondering if the herons is a deterrent. Small body, small amount of poison. <laughs> I know they would probably prefer the frogs. Yeah. How, how big are these? Uh, northern leopard frogs get about, say, about five inches um, without the legs extended. Just the bodies kind of snap to, to the tail, or the, where the tail would be the tush. <laughs> um, hibernation means spent at the bottom of the body of water. We've seen these guys active. Um, through October in some little oxbows, kind of along um, Plum Creek there. So depending on the weather and if it's really getting cold, if there's snow on the ground, they're again opportunist and they're just going to try to pack on as much food and uh, weight as possible. Um, so again, they'll, they'll probably eat crayfish too, things like that. So they're, they're really <coughs> tough, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of enemies out there. Northern leopard frog. Real variable pattern. Um, the big thing is you can see these stripes. They have them going from the eye there and back. And they have the same thing on the opposite side. Um, the bullfrogs tend to have a, a bigger uh, drum there. And the pattern can vary from a 
lime green to a dark brown, uh, depending, and the variable spots, lots of circles uh, of black on these guys. Almost looks like a, a camouflage. And do, do the bullfrogs don't have those lines, do they? No. Okay. And we'll play the sound here. I see it's kind of like a chuckle. Yeah. Um, and they can do those sounds in any variation. This is uh, a male calling uh, in the breeding season. And they're really neat to kind of observe during this, this time of year. You, you've seen them in ponds uh, just kind of swimming around and they'll pop their head up and they'll call for a moment and they'll look around, move off in a different direction, and, do, and you'll have various males doing the same thing at the same time. So. Um, they are a really neat species and something that really needs to kind of be protected in the park and left alone as much as possible for the most part. Uh, these are things that we don't want people to pick up generally and, and it's just best to observe them from a, a short distance and take as many pictures as you can and uh, let them do their thing. And of course we, we grab them every once in a while just to demonstrate to people that, you know, what they are and, and what they look like, leg size and things like that. But for the most part, it's kind of a hands-off species for sure. Are they most active at night too or during the day? Oh, in the day, I would say. Um, yeah, they're pretty active. Of course, we're more active during the day, so I think we obviously <laughs> probably did more of a walking, but we um, can see them in the mornings uh, when it's still relatively cool and uh, in the evenings also. I think in the heat of the day, Unless there's a good amount of shade, they will tend to kind of find some uh, cover. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Western chorus frog. Um, these are easiest to observe near small ponds in uh, early spring when they are basically all in the same area to breed. Um, they are small. They tend to fit on a, a dime. Um, they live in marshes, ponds, lakes. Uh, they have about 450 eggs, which is pretty good for a small species. Uh, and that can increase with the female size. So a lot of that is just how many eggs can that little body hold. Um, they also eat a lot of small invertebrates and are commonly preyed on by birds, small mammals, snakes. A lot of the same things that will eat any of the small uh, morphing, the toads, things like that, will definitely eat chorus frogs. They don't have any kind of uh, toxins or anything to that. But their best weapon is probably uh, the fact that they are so hard to find. Um, they blend in so well, and uh, they have a beautiful call, and usually that's what you will hear. Um, is just a lot of these things calling. I mean, just about every television show that has a pond scene in it tends to have one of these chorus frog calls in the background and pick them out more. I see that too. You know, that there. <laughs> so, um, hibernation tends to occur uh, not as deep as a lot of other things, but uh, logs, rocks, leaf litter, uh, loose soil things that they can burrow in, and um, we've lifted up logs and see them hibernating underneath logs before, so they can definitely vary where they hibernate quite a bit, in leaf litter, soft sand, things like that. What's their life cycle? Are they a year, or they, do they live longer than a year? They do. Um, I believe they, I'm not sure if it's four or five years or something like that, but I think the smaller species probably don't live as long as to get a leopard frog or a frog, something to that effect, but I couldn't tell you directly. Um, but they do morph the first year um, being a tadpole, and they will move on, and they're so relatively small. I would think that the males probably live longer than the females, as a guess, uh, just because usually the egg laying is pretty tough on the female, you know? So, and here is one. This is a really pretty example of one, actually. Um, you can 
see the small stripes on the back. They're not necessarily real prevalent. And this guy was probably, he fit right on the end of your finger, huh? Big boy, so. Yeah, they sure do. Here is the collar. They tend to say it's like uh, taking your fingernail and running along a comb. It's just a real distinct sound that once you've heard it a few times out here, you won't be able to forget it. It's these little chorus drums, and they have, like I said, a really huge voice.
they destroy all the other reptiles as far as numbers and you know, uh, probably I'd say fools. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're footballs. They are footballs. Like you can almost put your fist in them. When they're outstretched in their legs, I mean, you can be holding the body and the legs can reach down. I mean, they get really big. Not necessarily all of them, but uh, you can see these out in the park. A lot of times they'll be sitting on the edge or submerged in like uh, light plants. You'll just see their head kind of poking out and they have these really bright golden eyes and they have a really big, uh, this is, how you tend to see them here. Uh, they have a big eardrum, you can't really see it there, um, but big hip bones, and they have these little small spots all throughout their body. The, the leopard frogs tend to have bigger spots, and these guys will have a lot smaller ones. And again, variable in color. Uh, they can be a bright green to a dark brown. Um, so a lot of these things, color isn't the best indicator, it's more uh, body shape, size, things like that. But those bright golden eyes the tell tell sign. How far eyes did the leopard frog have to Because they look so No, they don't. They're they're brown. Brown. So the stripe on the leopard frog kind of carries through the eye, and the bullfrog is just this bright orange. All around. Here, and I know everyone's probably heard this one. That's a lot of them. Yeah. And these hang out a lot in muskrat. So that first little common person, the one that has the, the path and the all there. And you see those common on the edges over by the dock. I've seen them down the boardwalk, the actual dock. I've seen them over over there. We catch no tadpoles all the time. This concludes the turtle and amphibian <laughs> portion. Any question? What's the difference between a frog and a toad? Toads tend to be more land, land dwelling. Uh, they, they don't hug so much towards water. Um, so they tend to have different skin. Uh, toads will have a more warty type of skin generally. And uh, here at the park, it's real prevalent. Nothing has skin like that woodhouse toad. They just have little uh, nodes all over their, their body. It's quite different. Frogs um, and frogs are, are very smooth here. So. Well, they also don't frogs have to stay in this somewhat um, moisture moist, Yeah, moist conditions. Yeah. yeah. In our area, worldwide, there's a lot of toads that are school skating with okay. frogs and frogs and vice versa. There's thousands of species. It makes it a lot easier to talk about. But in general, yeah. Do toads go in the water? Do they go in Yeah, yeah. We've seen them swimming by in the plum creek. Huh. Yeah. I don't know. Float down there. So this concludes my portion. Uh, is there anything I can answer for you or any questions? So are there any differences between male and female? There can be some variability, but I couldn't tell you necessarily if snapping turtles and things like that, they'll, they'll have different shapes to their shells, um, mostly for breeding purposes and things like that. Um, same thing with painted turtles. Interesting thing about painted turtles is, is they do kind of this real elaborate breeding dance where the male will come up and he'll uh, kind of scratch the head of the female and if she's interested she'll come back and kind of do the same thing. So there's a lot of different things with breeding that, that kind of, for turtles, that, that make them, the male shell be a little bit curved so that he can kind of uh, accommodate the female shell. Um, as far as the toads, a lot of the toad, uh, the female would probably be larger, um, but it's not necessarily going to, do the males have the, uh, the, the engorged uh, 
uh, during, the during, the season. during the breeding season, they have a, a little nodule that kind of gets engorged on their hand. Only males call, so if it's a collar, frog or toe, that's obviously always going to be a male. Your toes and frogs? So, um, box turtles. We don't have any box turtles in this area. <coughs> really? Close. You have to go out east, like a little past Aurora, to start encountering them actually. People will let them go here. They actually don't naturally occur right here on the farm range. They like sandier soils out farther out east on the farm range. Oh, okay. We haven't seen any so far here either. We've only seen sandier in the field. I think uh, at the flats, um, the Carson Nature Center, they have a, a box turtle that they found there. Yeah, and somebody let it go. Yeah. Oh, somebody let it go. People take them home as pets, and they get sick of them, and they just turn them just like years apart. So, you know, they're really, really common out just like an owl out east. And so, you know, people are very common. We see, we see species turn up in Chatfield at the moment, oh. because it's surrounded by neighborhoods, and kid went camping out east or down in the Pueblo, across the map. It's pretty common. Turn it over to Joe. Oh, I think great. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This one's a great one. That is the best time to grab. Good. Nice job. How old is your salad? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm five years now. Really? Wow. Yeah. Just in the alarm go off and play it off here? No, no. Okay. Let's go to the Obviously the case. 
level one to chapter one. Most of the species here vary their activity depending on temperature and other surface conditions like the ground. So, you know, it's challenging for Dan and I to find these things sometimes because sometimes it's too dry, sometimes it's too hot. Um, they do follow some basic patterns though. Most of them are active during the daytime in the spring when the temperatures are in the 70s and 80s and it's nice and mild. As the summer rolls around and it gets really hot and dry, most of them switch and become nocturnal. So that's just sort of a basic um, behavior and pattern that you can apply to all the snake species that look here. And uh, one interesting thing about the snakes that live here is that uh, they all only have one functioning lung that runs most of the length of their body. Um, boas and pythons have two symmetrical functioning lungs, uh, but all the snakes here have one, and that's considered to be a more advanced development from snake evolution. They, they each have two, right? Right. One is independent. Um, what's the word? Like our head is. Uh, yeah, I can't think of it. Or a non functioning uh, organ. Not much of what we're using. So, okay. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about are the gutter snakes. And I'm going to show you some pictures. There are three species of chat, though, okay? And the one called the common gutter snake here is actually the least common, uh, right here at chat, though. And we represent the very, very southern tip of the range of the species. So when you can find one south in Chapel Park, which are very low numbers here. I've actually never seen them in the park. Um, my friends have sent me pictures of one that they found one over on the road that I was able to positively identify as being the species. They occur more commonly up by Boulder, um, and as you get farther north, uh, they're more of like a, a northern uh, cold weather species. But um, they're identified primarily by the red that you see on the sides there. No other garter snake species around here will have red sides like that. And it's usually usually pretty bright and distinct. And uh, the second least common, these are fairly abundant. You usually catch a couple in a year. This is called the plains garter snake. And it looks a lot like the other one that I'm about to show you, which is the most common one. But the defining characteristic is that bright orange stripe you see on the back. So that's what defines a plains. Garter snake. And <laughs> excuse me. Uh, sometimes uh, the other more common species that I'm going to show you will have a, a fairly yellow stripe, something akin to this. But this this bright orange and then also the black behind the head here is uh, really indicative of a plains garter snake. And oops. the most common and one that I'm sure you've seen a lot uh, is called the Western Terrestrial Garter Snake. It's kind of a mouthful. I'm not sure why they call that. Uh, but this is your quintessential garter snake that turns up in your yards. Uh, it's really common down here. I don't know how to how to describe its identifying characteristics other than it, it's mostly bland and without color. You know, the other ones have red, um, bright orange. This is mostly just pale with earth tones. It does have a striped out the back, but it's usually a cream color. Sometimes it gets a little bit orange. And in fact, uh, some of these species actually may hybridize with each other, and then things get really difficult as far as identification goes. So uh, that's how to visually identify them. Uh, there are actually four species of garter that inhabit Colorado, but three here at Chatfield. Garter snakes are a bi-bearing species, and that's not all that common. Um, one of only two in the park that gives birth to live young. Um, garter snakes are very opportunistic feeders. These guys really will eat just about anything. Uh, it's kind of unusual for snakes. A lot of snakes specialize in their food. Um, garter snakes will eat earthworms. They'll eat rodents, they'll eat fish, amphibians, and we've even actually seen them eat other snakes. So they will uh, cannibalize each other. <coughs> so um, another thing about gutter snakes, and uh, this kind of gets them in trouble sometimes, is that a lot of times they'll hibernate in large groups. So you may have seen those nature documentaries in the spring. Uh, it's usually farther north than Canada, but they'll be you know, just these huge, writhing mass of snakes outside a hibernation den. That's, that's garter snakes. Um, these guys do hard eating groups here in Chaffield. Um, uh, Dan especially found uh, a nice den that was just about to just go straight to the Platte River. There's a bunch of rocks lying in the river. And uh, if you show up there in the spring on the warm days, you'll see them come out in pretty large numbers from that hibernation den. So they hibernate underground just to get away from the, the frost and freeze. Females usually are uh, a little bit larger than males. It's, uh, just sort of a general rule. 
And uh, one of the things that you may have noticed if you're a an artist name is that they use a monster for effects. So um, they're preyed upon by um, a lot of the um, predators that we have here. They're eaten by birds. You know, if it's swimming across a pond, a large fish or a snapping turtle will take it. Raccoons are going to eat snakes. They definitely garter snakes. And, um, you know, they really don't have much in the way of uh, a defense like a lot of the snakes that we're going to um, talk about here shortly do. But what they'll do is they will release this um, really foul smelling fluid from their vents and you just kind of smear it all over them. And it really sticks around. It's very pungent. I call it lady repellent or field cologne. <laughs> It's, uh, it's pretty nasty. Um, and they, most of the species here are found near water. If you were to try to go look for one, your best bet would be uh, around ponds and rivers and stuff like that. They're found out in the fields. You'll find them wandering uh, far away from water. But a lot of the things they like to eat uh, garter snakes eat a lot of amphibians and fish and things, tadpoles, things like that, worms. And uh, those things are found near the water. So that's normally where we find all three species in Chatfield. So one more quick time, Western terrestrial is the right one, the bright orange stripe is the plain garter snake, and then the least common and arguably most beautiful is the common red side garter snake. If anyone ever sees one of these in the park and you have a camera on you and you're able to document it and either send the information along uh, to myself or Dan or to Emily, I would very much like to hear about that. Okay, uh, next species might be my favorite. Um, this is probably one of the most commonly misidentified snakes here in Colorado. Almost every time I get an email and I see the subject line, what kind of snake is this, before even looking at the picture, every time, it's going to be one of these. It's called a yellow belly bracer. So as an adult, this species is usually almost all uniform olive green on brown on top, and have a yellow belly next to the yellow belly bracer. But the reason that people have such a hard time identifying them is because when they're young, this is what they look like. They have a really heavy pattern to them, almost like the milk snake that I showed you at first. I mean, not the trained eye, but red, white, and, um, you know, in the first year, it'll start to look like this. You can see it's, it's not the best picture, but it's retaining some of the pattern, uh, but it's also starting to fade and become more uniform in color. Now, this species is one of the most common snakes in Chatfield Park. Um, it occupies almost every habitat. You can find these things absolutely anywhere in the park. They're opportunistic feeders, kind of like the garter snakes. Uh, they eat a lot of mammals and lizards. They'll eat amphibians, and they'll even eat other snakes. Um, juveniles have been known to eat insects, but I think that's actually probably pretty rare. I haven't heard about it documented too much, but uh, the species is very cannibalistic. And I think that I can even have a picture. So I came across this scene down at the Platte River one day. And what you have here is a large adult female racer consuming the juvenile racer, which is still pretty big, uh, but you can see it still has some of the pattern on it, and this is actually kind of a nice comparison between you know, a one-year-old and probably a three or four-year-old snake. And didn't care that I was there. I mean, I didn't want to disturb it because it was the fall, and the sky needed its meal, or she needed her meal, even at the expense of the snake as being swallowed. Uh, um, it, it let me photograph the whole event from start to finish, and it was really uh, pretty awesome to witness. Did it start with the head or the tail? Start with the head. And the uh, tail just disappeared right down. Um, so are they sort of greenish as adults? They are. A lot of times it just looks like a green snake. Um, I've seen them pretty bright, almost the same color as the grass. And in fact, you guys saw one and you didn't know what it was, which yeah. is a perfect example it's of what I'm talking about. Do you think that the pattern on the, the, the hatchling is probably like that just for, camp, for protecting us? Is that 
It's hard to speculate on those things. It really is. I'm not sure, because <laughs> the pattern of the adult works great. It's kept the grass. It's right. all great. So yeah. I'm really not sure. Maybe it looks like one of the colors or something. It's hard to know. OK. Next up is the bull snake. And Mr. Baker has an exquisite example of the species. He actually, um, I believe one of his coworkers brought to him a wild albino specimen that was found out uh, just a little bit. So this is a one of many tens of thousands of currents, and unfortunately they didn't kill it or anything like that. It was yeah. very small. The ant has it in his possession now. But this is what they typically look like. Uh, this is down in one of the ponds at Chatfield. This was an adult that I found. Um, okay, I guess that's the only picture I have. But you all know what bull snakes look like, right? So let me just write that something down. Yeah. Um, they have heard, uh, essentially a, you want to tell them about the difference between a male and a female there? It's the tail. Um, one way that you can tell, um, males normally have a longer, longer tail, um, tapers less quickly. Um, the tail sort of the back that is down to the So it's difficult. I mean, you basically need to, you know, one of these steps to, to See a real monster, chances are it's a female. Chances are it's a what? It's a female. Okay. They get really, really intimidated big. So they are the largest snake in Chatfield. And like the previous species that I've described, they occupy almost every habitat in the park. Has anybody ever seen one here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We yeah. see them a lot. They're, they're pretty common. Um, they're awesome. How big do they get? They get almost 70. Six feet long, five, six feet. I mean, really, very large. Adults feed almost entirely on mammals and birds. And there is a myth that they eat rattlesnakes. And that's not true. And I've heard people say, oh, you know, I don't worry about rattlesnakes because I see bull snakes in the barn and they eat rattlesnakes. So it's not true. They're both attracted to rodents. They're both probably there. Um, they do also feed on the eggs of ducks and waterfowl, and a lot of times Audubon people are birders, and so there's some contention between the bird watchers and the bull snakes because people go out and monitor a waterfowl nest for the entire spring and wait for the chicks to hatch, and the bull snake will come along and just wipe it out. But, you know, that's nature. And uh, bull snakes are the only snake in the park, well, yeah, bull snake too, uh, that subdues its prey by constriction. So this is a very strong snake. And it'll grab a hold of its prey, a mammal or a bird, and wrap coils around it very tight like a bow or a python do. You know, crush bones and squeeze the life out of the animal. So that's how. Wait. That's how <laughs> oh, you're so great. <laughs> <laughs> he just trying to get all our shirt. Another thing about bull snakes is that they mimic rattlesnakes. And this is good for wild predators, but it gets them in trouble with people a lot. Um, Dan and, I both, um, Dan and I have both found bull snakes with their heads chopped off, and it's unfortunate. I mean, I don't know if it's always a case of mistaken identity or people just hate snakes, but um, bull snakes will put on quite a show where they will get into this S-shaped position with their head that looks like a rattlesnake's defensive pose. They'll hiss in a manner that actually sounds a lot like a rattlesnake's rattle, and they'll also vibrate their tail. And so if you don't know your snakes and you don't want to take any chances, they unfortunately do um, end up getting killed quite a bit, even though they're excellent for pest control and just great part of the ecosystem and really um, have a place here. So, um, like I described with um, most other species, these guys vary their activities depending on the time of year. So, in the springtime, we find them crawling around a lot um, during May, early June in particular. And then as it really starts to get hot in June, which we Emily and I talk about uh, when it comes to our field hikes, they switch and they become nocturnal and they're pretty tough to find. Um, you just have to kind of drive around on some back, lonely back roads at night and hope that you see one stretch across the road that has been hit by a car. And that's how we find them in the summer. And um, they're often found near human developments like farms and other areas that have high uh, rodent populations because the 
they love the love room. So at the horse tables, the chat club is a good bet. Um, if you have one of the bulls thing, you can stroll up there during the one month of the year and just talk to anybody that works the stables and say, hey, um, have you seen any snakes in the way? And they could probably show you where they see the bull snakes all the time. And that's just because of the feed for the horses and traps programs. These guys hibernate in the ground, usually in both burrows and things like that. And I've seen them hibernating with red snakes before. So is a rodent burrow like a type of like hole in the ground? Prairie dog, bull, it doesn't even have to be that huge. I've seen a big snake come up in a really small burrow in the fall. So just anywhere where they can get deep enough below uh, the frost. So does anybody have any questions about bull snakes? My favorites. You guys are actually popular in the country. Why is that? People like thick body, constricting snakes as pets. Those are my dogs, which can count in the country. These guys are available in a whole bunch of cool color indications. They just actually make really good pets. You can buy frozen roses in the year. They can be really docile. That one's got a bit of an attitude. It's almost docile. He's really good. Okay, so yeah, milk we'll snake. Okay, it's hard. It's hard for this now to be my favorite snake. It's just so beautiful, and uh, I'll never forget the first time Dan and I found one of these in chat. And they're just beautiful. It looked just like this one here. No, we've we've got it down pat now. But when we first started looking, we, we could not find it. And the reason is because this is a very secretive snake. Um, I said up here. Um, they're very secretive and they're very seasonal. You can really only find milk snakes on the surface from maybe the last week in April to like the middle of June, and that's if it's really mild and we've had good rain. Um, but for the rest of the time here, it's either too cold or too hot for them, and they really spend a lot of time underground. So they're very common throughout Chatfield. We've found them in every corner of the park and in a number of different types of habitats, but. I'm going to bet none of you have ever seen one. I'll bet the rangers haven't seen one. It really takes a very determined effort to locate one of these snakes in the wild. And uh, that's something that Dan and I have mastered. Like, well, we found dozens of them here in the park. So we feel really good that there's a nice healthy population of these snakes here. Uh, like we talked about, it mimics the Baptist coral snake with the collar bands and stuff like that. It's a little curious if you don't have coral snakes there. So, but I'm assuming that still maybe it triggers some sort of response in the potential predator that says, you know, toxin or venomous or something like that. So, that's what people speculate uh, that um, tricolor pattern might be for. Uh, this also subdues its prey by constriction. It eats like any kind of small mammal that it could fit in its mouth. And it definitely eats a lot of lizards. So uh, there's a lizard species in Chatfield that I'm going to talk about at the end. And that's a main prey species. It's called a six line prey fern. That's a main prey species of this milk snake. And uh, they also eat other snakes. And I learned that the hard way when one time I was out riding the road at night and I was picking snakes out and putting them in containers to photograph the next morning. And I put a milk snake in with something called a black headed snake. And the milk snake grabbed it, tried to swallow it. You wouldn't think that would happen plucked off the road and thrown into a plastic container. But, uh, these are also popular as pets and they're often taken from the wild. And that makes me glad that they're so secret and difficult to find because I think they would be exploited. There's a couple places in Colorado where they're known to occur in really high numbers and they're pretty easy to get to. People throw boards down um, to lure them under the boards and they go out there and flip the boards and collect snakes. And before some of the more strict division of wildlife laws were enacted. Uh, it used to be legal to take them. And people would go out uh, in certain places and just take them dozens and dozens at a time and sell them, you know, to the pet trade. It's just a unsavory behavior that I don't really appreciate very much. Uh, so the curious thing about this snake is that it gets the name milk snake because there was a suspicion back in the day uh, the early settlers that these snakes were climbing up in sucking milk off the udders of the cows. And it's because, uh, again, the rodents being in the barns, the snakes were attracted to the rodents as a food source, and the farmers were seeing them, you know, in their dairy farm. What else is there? And thinking that, you know, why are these snakes here? It must be cows. So 
It's sort of a, it's sort of a curious <laughs> name for a, for a very beautiful and distinct snake. And these guys are kind of variable. Uh, sometimes they're almost white with just a little bit of black and red. Other times they have really thick bands. Here's, you can see, you know, the youngster starts out very, very vibrant with the bright. And then, you know, he'll probably look something like this when he's older, that white will fade. But not always, sometimes it doesn't end. I think the ones at Chaffield actually are some of the most beautiful in the state. <coughs> they just have a lot of red on them. Great. You guys hanging in there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So next up is this curious little thing. This is called Western Pagano Snake. Has anyone seen one of these before? Okay. Well, hopefully they will identify it for you. Okay. This, what they call rostral scale, is um, a specialized scale adaptation that we suspect is a burrowing tool. So these guys really like soft, sandy soil. Oh, you're fine. Uh, we find in Chaffield occasionally, but only out in the um, sort of prairie, sandy habitat. Um, kind of near Highline Canal, if you can picture that in that river. It's a huge open sandy area out there. There's also one hit by a car right in the entrance way to um, the building that we're in right now. So they turn up, um, but they're not common. So I, I would say this is probably the rarest snake in the park, maybe, that we have um, definitively documented to live here. Always active during the day. We've never seen a hog at night, ever, ever. They love it really, really hot. When all the other snakes are underground in the summer hiding from guys are just out crawling around just looking for lizards to eat or something. But it's, it's really incredible. So they're very much a summer daytime hot weather species. Like I said, they like sandy soils. So we're coming out east. Still, they'll prey on baby rodents. They eat a lot of lizards and they also eat reptile eggs. And people suspect that, that burrowing um, scale on the nose is not only so that they can get under the soil but also so that they can root out the eggs of, say, turtles and other snakes and things like that. So they have a very well developed sense of smell, and they have that specialized tool for digging the sand in them. They'll get in there, consume some eggs. Another really interesting thing about this species, and I wish I had a video of this, is that they feign death. And you may, or you may have seen this on a nature show or something like that, but hog nose snakes, um, this is something that they do. And the species that we have out here doesn't really put on quite the dramatic display that we want. Eastern Bible State and Eastern United States does, but it still will do it. And um, it's especially um, it's easy to get them to do it in the presence of canines. So, like if you're walking the dog and the dog starts sniffing the snake, and they, you know they think that that's a response uh, for the local canine predators that we have around here, like coyotes and fox and things like that. Uh, it's to make them seem like they're dead and um, you know unappealing to eat. And what they'll do is they'll flip over on the back. They'll open their mouth and stick their tongue out, and they expel this <laughs> fluid from their mouth, and they'll get you know musk into it and all that, and they really just look and smell like they're dead. So um, that's something that um, is very well developed in the species that you know other species will you know sometimes kind of play that a little bit, but they don't take it to the degree that the western species does. So that's kind of neat. Um, the coloration mimics uh, type of rattlesnake that we have out of east a little bit. Uh, the hoggins is more common but that we don't have here. So I mean, it, it looks very, very much like uh, the species of rattlesnake that was already used. And another curious thing about these guys is that um, they're actually mild, mildly venomous. So um, they have sort of large rear fangs, teeth, and their saliva is pretty toxic. And so you know this is like a point of contention among scientists and things like that. But you know, compared to the racer, the bull snake, or something like that, these guys have large fangs and a rather mild, detoxic uh, saliva. But fortunately, they almost never bite. I mean, I've handled dozens and dozens and never been bit. It's just weird. Um, they just won't bite. So that's good. Um, so the venom and the, the fangs are used for prey. And a lot of times, um, you know, it's something like that. <coughs> So they feed on frogs, toads, small mammals. Um, I guess I did the right. How big is he? No, about as big as that one. Like that would be massive size. Big, maybe about that big. So 
the Nazi might not have used Four, three. Okay, there the pen shop can be pretty bad stops to make the not August thunder like a lot of water. That was it. Yeah. No. This, this, uh, yeah, this was actually hit near the stables and was given to me by Susan Kermit. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. She had frozen it and we were doing a presentation for Junior Rangers. Okay. Hit by a car. Unfortunate. Yeah, but that's the one we lose. All right. Does anybody have any questions on this very curious little speech? This is kind of a unique one, so if you're <laughs> about this, let me know. It's alcohol. Uh, just wrote it up. So, uh, here's a more full body shot of a couple of babies. It's not the best picture, but you can see the pattern on it. Big fat head. Alright. Old Notorious. This is the last one. I'm going to spend some time on this one. The rattlesnake that we have here in Chatfield State Park is called the prairie rattlesnake. A lot of people think the western diamondbacks, but they're not. And here's a gorgeous example. Um, this isn't at Chatfield, but it gives you an idea of how, if you're not careful, and you have, so they come from this direction and stepped over this tuft of grass and put your foot down right there, put the boots on. Here's a youngster. So um, they all mostly look alike. Um, there's really not a whole lot of variation in, in the uh, prairie rattlesnakes that we see down here. So it is the only really truly venomous and dangerous snake that we have living around here. And they do occur in Chatfield. They are mainly found in the Jefferson County section, which is where we are. Right? So really from right about this building, up north along Wadsworth, to the horse stables, a little bit farther north, it's like the main entrance to the park, out to the Platte River. I don't know if you can picture this, I wish I had a map, but it's basically like a triangular sliver of land in between the Platte River and along Wadsworth Boulevard. And that's where you'll find the rattlesnakes in the park. There are some horse stables, which you're probably familiar with, and behind the horse stables are some hill summits, some sandy hills. There's a lot of rodents there, and there are a lot of rattlesnakes there. So if you want to go and you want to see a rattlesnake, you can check the state park, put some boots on, and go to those hills behind the horse stables, just kind of walk through the grass. You'll see them up there. They're pretty common, actually. In fact, they show up on the road, too, and they get run over a lot, unfortunately. So, uh, rattlesnakes prey mainly on lizards and mammals, um, most exclusively. The young, you know, will take lizards because of the size, um, just being appropriate, and adults feed mostly on mammals. And, um, let's see. Let's see. Okay, so yeah, again, as I've been talking about the snakes, you'll see a pattern come up, and that is that they're active during the day, diagonal, active during the day, during the spring and in the fall when it's pleasant outside, that you would find it pleasant, 70s, 80s, something like that. And then when it gets really hot in the summer, they switch and become nocturnal. And you just won't find them in the daytime, maybe in the very early morning, but as soon as the sun goes down, they come out and they start crawling. And when we drive around the roads, the rural roads at night, we see them. Um, during the summer a lot on roads at night. Uh, this is the second species that is a live bear. So we have the garter snakes, those gave birth to a lot of these, and then the rattlesnake also does the same thing. And people speculate that this live bearing thing developed uh, in sort of uh, cold weather species. Um, so, you know, uh, an adult female snake that it has young uh, developing inside it is able to thermal regulate, whereas, you know, if you deposit it, egg somewhere, it's pretty much at the mercy of the elements, temperature, predators, whatever. But, you know, this female snake can carry um, the babies with her and bask in the sun or cool off if she needs to. So, you know, garden snakes and rattlesnakes, you can speculate, um, you know, that live bear can develop um, in cold regions. Um, this is another species that hibernates in large groups and also hibernates from other species. So, like the garden snakes, they'll keep returning to the same den over and over again. And they'll congregate sometimes in pretty large numbers. And so in the spring and in the fall, if you know one of these dense sites is, you can go there and see them, you know, basking in the sun, uh, just kind of soaking up whatever heat they can. <coughs> so yeah, they return to the same habitat. 
Um, the species has a very small range based on radio traffic studies. I have been privileged to hear some talks uh, from some folks who have done their own radio tracking studies on the species. And what they found is that they don't travel far at all. Um, they will find a place in the light that has an adequate food supply that's you know within a reasonable distance from where they're hiding, and they'll stay there. I mean, they'll move 100 yards that way and come back, 100 yards that way and come back. But they're not a roaming species, if you will, like really all the other species that I've described are. Um, they have a weak venom compared to most rattlesnakes. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, um, bites are serious with fire medical attention. That's, you want to do that. I'm not trying to mislead you here at all. But just to give you an example, uh, there's a little species of rattlesnake that lives uh, just over the mountains on the Colorado Utah border. And its venom is about 30 to 50 times more potent than the ones that we have here. And I mean, even twice or 10 times, you know, would really be a lot. But 30 to 50 gives you an idea that, I mean, while this is a, a, a dangerous animal, and certain people are more sensitive to the venom than others, if you get bit by a rattlesnake and don't want your hand, you can really die because you're not. And it just doesn't really happen anymore. Um, go get medical attention. So yeah, I think I might have uh, <coughs> make sure. So yeah, I just want to quickly just tell you, you know, if you get bit by a rail snake on one of your appendages, for example, don't try to suck the blood out that's in there. It causes trauma to the site. It doesn't really extract any venom. It's already in the bloodstream. So it's enough to do that. Um, if you do get bit on your hand or your foot or something like that, just take out a piece of you know, clothing or a belt or something like that and tie a very loose tourniquet just to kind of um, try to keep the blood from circulating throughout your body. Stay calm. Definitely get to the hospital. And I hate to tell you, but it's going to cost you a fortune to get the hand down. So don't get bit by a snake. Like 75% of bites, I think, are by males who are under the influence of alcohol. That's a good thing. You know, they're not an aggressive species. They're not just going to crawl in your house and bite you. But, you know, people get drunk and sleep and they end up getting bit. So yeah, obviously, uh, the species of these is prey to them. Uh, it has muscles on the head. I'm not sure you can see the head of mine too well, but um, mm -hmm. the rattlesnake has a very thick, uh, distinct triangular head, right? It's distinct from the body. And it's because there are uh, two big venom glands right here. And it has uh, muscular control of this, and it's able to um, you know, determine how much venom it wants to inject. And sometimes it'll do what's called a dry bite, which is it knows that you know, you're not prey, and it doesn't want to waste its venom, it just wants to give you a little warning. It'll just kind of tap with its fangs and not squeeze those glands and inject that venom. So that's, you know, for me, that's kind of a hopeful thing if I ever be get there, that's going to happen. Is that a myth of <coughs> What's that? Is it true that don't get bit by the younger ones? They don't have control? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I would much rather be bit by a vapor house than the children. They've done tasks. They haven't been able to find any uh, difference between the toxicity. So, like, the baby's venom is more toxic. Um, another thing that's been proposed is that the babies don't have quite the control over the amount of venom that they inject versus the adults, or maybe they just get scared or just have to that. That's possible. But just in terms of sheer volume of venom injected, I would much rather get bit by a little baby mouse than take a really bad bite from just huge adults. So, thank you for bringing that up. Um, like I said, rattlesnakes can't control the amount of venom to live. They've proven this in studies. Um, yeah, myths, that's us get this. Uh, so uh, for treatment, they have something which is called anti-venom. Um, it's a horse serum. So what they do is they inject a horse with very low amounts of venom, and the horse builds antibodies um, you know, to break down the venom. We extract those and concentrate them and freeze them. And um, they, you know, the mixture that you would get in the hospital would be a combination of actually this species, cotton mouth, and some other thing on the West Coast and things like that. Um, so that's how anti venom works. I should call it anti um, So these tail segments, uh, the rattle of the rattlesnake, is made out of hair. I think that's where finger has made it, right? Yeah. So what happens is the snake sheds its skin, and most of the time, uh, when it does that, a hard segment just sort of gets deposited and formed at the end of this tail. And you cannot accurately tell the age of the rattlesnake by counting the its rattles. That's another way. Obviously, the more it has, the older it is, you know, because it takes time for those you know, to build. Um, if you see a, a little one with a little butt, um, it's in the sound. But no, you can't, you know, there's no one to one comparison where, you know, 10 seconds equals 10 years as well. 
Uh, the muscles that shake for rousing its tail are some of the fastest that are known in the animal kingdom. We thought that was pretty cool. Um, they're able to fire 50 times a second, which is pretty neat. So that's what gives that, that buzz. Um, another interesting thing about rattlesnakes, which is um, not something that we see in any other species here in the park, is that males will combat for females. And this is, again, something that you may have seen on the nature show. Uh, but the males will sort of try to wrestle each other, they'll intertwine, and their heads and necks will raise up and try to push the other one down and um, you know, dominate it physically like that. And that's how they win the right to make it with whatever female happens to be in the area that's fighting. So I've never witnessed this, unfortunately, but I know people that have, and I just think that would be the coolest thing to see. Can you tell the difference? Because I know that, at least the rattlesnakes in Arizona, they do that same thing when they're mating. They intertwine like that, and they stay all wrapped up each other yeah. while they're mating. Yeah, sometimes they will mating. Um, you can usually tell the difference. A lot of times, uh, if it's a mating, um, to the example of mating, you'll see uh, the females maintains like a little monster on the ground, and the male will kind of go on top of her and kind of ride her and you know he'll be you know messing with her a little bit but not not that deliberate trying to get above and push the other one down so much that's more of a male combat behavior and um, you know this species is uh, just very advanced on um, the venom delivery system the rattle those are things that make it unique one last thing that I want to point out um, this thing is called a pit viper and where it gets that name from is a series of pit um, between the eye and the Right there. Nose, eye. I don't know if you can really see that. That little black circle right over here is the key. So these snakes possess uh, a, a sensory um, ability that we don't have. They're able to actually see, they speculate, um, heat that's given off, right? So um, it's called a heat pit. It's going to be wrong. That's where the big pit right comes from. So, you know, they've done a whole bunch of tests where they've blindfolded these snakes and they put hot targets in front of them, and in the dark, you know, all this, this thing is very accurately able to pinpoint, you know, the warm target and hit it um, just by using those heat sensitive hits. So we speculate that it's something like uh, an infrared camera, you know, the predator, where he's like looking at, and see all the warm bodies sticking out against the whole background. We, we just speculate that they see something like that, they can actually see, but no one really knows exactly how they experience it. So this little little guy. Okay. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions about rattlesnakes? How many young do they? That's a good question. Um, I have seen litters eight to twelve. So that I would say is probably the like normal average age of um, And it goes by size. So a smaller female, they just have four snakes like our first year, and really big. So, so it depends on how nourished they are. How big are they? At first, when they're born, it's um, uh, wide open. They're not, they're not usually very 
it's the dog, and it, it usually does take quite a bit of provocation to get one of these guys to bite. If you stepped on one accidentally, that would classify this. <laughs> and they, they speculate that that's why the grouse can develop this power on the tail in the first place. It's a warning mechanism against hooded animals that might otherwise step on it, out of it, just to warn, you know, bison or you know, anything else that can accept this much. You just have to step on it over here. So how often do they build on their tails? Every time you shed? Every so time it depends. You know, um, they'll typically shed in the spring or in the and then they'll, um, when they're young, um, they shed more frequently because they're growing faster. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as an adult, they probably only have yeah, one section of the year. Um, as babies, they have yeah. So, But, you know, it all depends on the conditions and how much food they have to eat and all that stuff. So, so there's no real step in that you How long do they live? That's another question. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess. Um, I, I don't know, but uh, just based on. Vipers the same size, I would say, um, you know, potentially like 30 years or so. They can live for decades. So in captivity, um, yeah, tens of years for sure. In the wild, it's very close to that. But yeah, potentially for tens of years. What other venomous kind of snakes do, you, do we have in the state? The only venomous snakes, there are three species of rattlesnake, like in Colorado, there's the only venomous snakes. Yeah, there's a little Massasaga pygmy thing that looks on Kansas border, and then there's another little which lives on the Colorado and Utah border. Uh, but the vast majority of Colorado, the far right, most of the eastern plains and stuff like that, uh, is just a family. So, so you, are, really, you really have to try to very hard to find the right ones. How high do they live in elevation? Pretty high, around 10,000 feet. Yeah. So um, they're, they're quite cold tolerant. Um, and I believe that their ability to give live birth is probably responsible for that because the only species of snakes can find at those altitudes are bird snakes and rats. And they're all over. And then actually there's a third kind, but that takes <coughs> the eggs until like the very, very last couple of days before they hatch and then deposits them and hatch them three days later. So that most of the time you want to be very well. Is this a little speaker? It's, a, it's from the albino. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know. I, my daughter gets the name up and she changes the name probably weekly. <laughs> so uh, he, he doesn't he doesn't respond to anything. <laughs> well, they're deaf. <laughs> Snakes are deaf, by the way. Um, but they can feel by yeah. Okay. So before I move on to our little video, I'll send it. On the whole class, so they maybe just eat on the fair, or they also smell. I do not believe these are. They have good eyesight. Amazing sense of smell, um, you know. So motion, smell, heat, for sure. I think the heat thing is mostly because uh, they do spend so much time as nocturnal hunters. From you know, from the majority of the actors, they're out at night. So you have another question. Yeah. Um, I know racer that was eating a garter 
and it got flustered and regurgitated the garter, and when the garter came up, it had a different species of younger garter in its mouth. So it was hands down one of the most bizarre <laughs> And I wish that I had to start the situation, but I never would have known what a flustered mess of The only thing that doesn't really get solved at all is broken air. Uh, some of the old times. It depends. If it stays cold, um, they won't digest it for very well. I'll pass it a lot more than the time. It's not like that. But if it has access to, to a good heat source, whatever it needs to do, that could be not much Is it solid? Is that kind of solid? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it looks like, you know, the closest thing about it, it looks like the geese poop that you see all over the place, but brown and white. So like There's a little white part in there that the bird creates, uh, but then a uh, mass of. Yeah. Alright, I'm going to move on to the other side. I wish I had more pictures of these guys. They're really fast. Um, most of my pictures are terrible. Uh, you really can't even see the animal. Uh, this is one I got my hands on and kind of closed so that you can just get sort of a close up feel for these guys. So, this is called a six line race run. It has six stripes down the back and it is fast as hell, so that's where the race runner it comes from. Um, these guys are a little smaller than the tiger salamander. They might get about as long as that, but they're not stuck. They're sort of a lightly built, very fast, very alert animal. Um, so these guys are active during the day. Okay, yeah, so it's the only lizard in the park that we've discovered. It is found throughout the park. We have seen these guys absolutely everywhere. I mean, our map of the Six Line Race Runner coverage of Chatfield State Park is very continuous. There's not a lot of broken up places. Um, the very wettest areas, you won't find them in like small um, cattails or, you know, in a very, very wet area. Um, they like solid ground. Um, they are mainly insectivorous. I can picture them taking down um, very small vertebrates and stuff like that too, so they, can, so they can catch them. But uh, the main, their main diet is uh, insects. Uh, they're almost entirely diurnal. I think I found one at night, and I suspect it was just because something spooked it wherever it was rested and just kind of scurried off into the night, and I had to come across it. Um, but they love it really, really hot, kind of like that western hognose snake. They like bright sunny days really, really hot, warm, daytime conditions. And that's when these guys become active. They get supercharged in the heat, and they're just tearing all over the place, running away from predators and grabbing insects, and um, kind of like that racer that I described, you're a very, very alert animal. Like, they'll look you in the eye, you know? Like, as you walk up on one, it's constantly watching you to see, you keep maintaining the distance between you, it might keep foraging, but as you get close, they'll just scurry and maintain, like, you know, what it considers to be a safe distance. Just a very alert animal, and uh, those racer snakes that I was talking about actually eat these things. And the behaviors and things really line up. Um, that racer snake is a very active, very alert, daytime predator. This guy is a very active, alert predator. So um, they're found a lot of same kind of things. Um, let's see. So it is the males that have this blue. So the females will typically have a white belly, and that is how you can distinguish a male from a female. Uh, the females will still a lot of times have green on their sides, but it's usually just the males that have that, that blue blush on their throat or their side and side. So that's how you can sex one if you can ever get close enough to it. Um, they're really common actually right around this building. Yes. Um, we see them, there's a, a little natural vegetation zone here. Um, with some trails going through it. And just come down here and eat hot sunny day during the summer and just look at this and just see them scurrying around. What's the black thing on the side of the Uh This is in here. Eardrum. How big are they get? Almost as long as that guy, but not going to stop. They're kind of just a little slender little thing. <coughs> Most people mistake them for skates. What those are. We actually don't have any skates right here. So whenever someone says they saw a skink, this is probably that way. Mm -hmm. The salamander. 
they try to get that. Yeah. What a tease. Uh, like a lot of lizards, um, these guys will drop their tails as a defense mechanism. So if it is grabbed by a youth or a snake or something like that by the tail, um, they have breakage points in the vertebrae of the tail that just, you know, apparently don't seem to hurt too much and the tail will, you know, wriggle and flop around all over the place. And it's supposed to be like a diversionary tactic to kind of let the, give the uh, predator pause for a second and give the lizard a chance to escape. And um, juveniles are born in the late summer, and they're really common. Um, like in October, September and October, it's like that. If you're walking around on a nice warm summer day, you see these tiny little lizards, and uh, they have bright blue tails, as babies all placenta do. So I wish I had a picture of that, but not. Where do these things? Like, do they be in females and rock? Rocky females? No. Like, where, where do they I nest? I should have that. Uh, they nest in the sand. Uh, Baker and I have actually witnessed females laying eggs in Chapel. Oh. And uh, it was just in, just on a little sandy hill. Um, there was just, you know, very loose sand, sparse vegetation hillside. Bob read the one of the ponds where snap turtles were laying eggs right alongside. And um, they were just burrowing down. They made a little burrow. That was kind of an experience we got to work with them. We saw a snap of turtles and six line witch runners like eggs. Right? So, did they do, like, I know the snap turtle here lays its eggs by an anthill, so it's a it's dirt that's been turned up. Are they doing the same thing? Are they you know, finding animals too? I don't, frequently? I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to, but I just thought it was curious that they were laying, and there were several females laying like, in the same spot in the snap of turtles. So, it's something, I don't know if it was the soil or what, but. Both species found it very desirable. So, I don't really know what else to say about these guys. Um, it's just nice to have them in the park. You know, they're, uh, they serve as a food source for a lot of important things. And um, they eat a lot of insects and things like that, which is amazing. They're the ones that do the push-ups. Yes. Those are. Uh, you want to some more tails? Tails will do that sometimes. The few really fences. Yeah. <laughs> 
these are the ones we do see the most. Um, I think the kids really want to know about it, so I highly encourage you guys to pay attention because they, everyone wants to know about this stuff. Not just the kids, but adults too. So, on average, what frog species found in Chatfield produces the most eggs? Woodhouse. What is the bullfrog? <laughs> You're a bullfrog. Which of the following amphibians deposit egg masses in water? Just a moment to think about it and I'll just start eliminating. You don't have to write anything down, just you know, just kind of a fun thing to go over, some of the things we talked about. And just, yep, all of the above. They are all the all the amphibians that lay their uh, eggs in water. Why don't you just why don't you do hands? You wanna why do that? You want to do that? And sure. Sort of things that add in. Um, which species of amphibian makes the following call? Let's see here. Let's see here. First. <laughs>
So, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. All the snake species in Chatfield have how many functioning lungs? No, I guess. <laughs> it was a it was a lapse of so. Functioning lungs is one. They have two lungs, but this was just uh, that's my fault. I'll take credit for that. I was thinking they have two lungs. One doesn't work. I'm kind of right. What species of reptile? One wrong for me. Chatfield can average over 35 pounds. Oh, it's not. That's right. Male or female? Male. Yes. I did not waste my time tonight. Which species of amphibian makes the following call? Yeah, I mean, if they 
it's some reasonable size group of some kids at home. Your spouse goal for our injury. I'll have to draft up some liability. I'm just going to see what. Part of the big group, you know. Yes. Yeah, plus, another thing is that you know the animals kind of take the big group too. Everyone wants some time to take a picture, hold it, and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Skeleton, like all the other 